Madam Speaker, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, delegates, I'm honored to be invited to address this House and the Physicians of America. Hello and good afternoon, and thank you for hosting me at the American Medical Association's annual meeting. And I want to give special thanks to Dr. Steve Stack, President of the AMA, Dr. Jim Madera, CEO of the AMA, Dr. Sue Bailey, Speaker of the House of Delegates, Dr. Steve Permit, the Chairman of the Board, the delegates, and all the members of the American Medical Association, and perhaps most of all, the physicians who serve our beneficiaries and consumers every day. Whether you're in the room today, or reading this speech 140 characters at a time on Twitter. <clears throat> it's because these patients, well first I want to also make sure to, thank, to take the, a moment to thank Rich Dean for all the straight talk, honesty, ideas, and convictions that you've brought to our relationship. In speaking to America's physicians, you represent one of America's most potent and proudest forces of talent and ability. For when anyone across the world is in need of care, there's no one they would rather be cared for than by America's doctors. I'm here to talk about the historic opportunity we have before us to change how Medicare pays for care, but I'm also here to engage in a conversation about something bigger. Revising a pattern of regulations and frustration and ultimately unleashing a new wave of collaboration between the people who spend their lives taking care of us and those of us whose job it is to support that cause. Today's discussion continues a conversation that Jim and I began publicly in January, in San Francisco in January. The conversation for us has continued every week since then with practicing physicians across the country in big practices and small, specialists in primary care, those in new payment models and in traditional ones. We've connected directly now with tens of thousands of physicians and other clinicians in some form and hundreds in more intensive conversations. It has been a process of giving frontline physicians a direct voice to us and of CMS, starting with me and senior staff, learning how to listen better. Most of you became physicians because of the desire to serve and heal people. Since I've been inside CMS for this short time, I've seen something similar, a drive where the staff every day wakes up thinking about one thing the lives of 140 million Americans, most on fixed or modest incomes, many in the most vulnerable stages of their lives, who depend on you through Medicare, Medicaid, children's health insurance, and marketplace programs. And it is because these patients depend on you, particularly at a time of such great need and uncertainty, and often at a time when they need guidance through a complex, fragmented system that I stand here today to say we can and we must take this opportunity to do better, to sharpen our focus on paying for what works, to reduce the time physicians and their offices spend on paperwork, to make healthcare technology to make healthcare technology a tool, not an industry. And, and to do this by carrying forward an open process that reduces the gulf between how policies are made in Washington and frontline patient care. So this afternoon, I will tell you about the opportunity with MACRA, discuss our work to create the proposed rule, and how we've been listening since then, and we'll lay out the critical challenges that we need your feedback on. So let's begin the discussion of MACRA by looking 
at what Congress did last April when it passed and the President signed the Bipartisan Medicare Access and Ship Reauthorization Act. This ended permanently the deeply flawed sustainable growth rate formula. This formula created 17 potentially deep cuts for Medicare physicians over the last 13 years and left physicians, patients, and indeed us feeling like pawns in the equation. Thanks to your hard work and advocacy, we now have bipartisan legislation that holds the potential to bring long-term stability and reliability to the Medicare program and to move the system in a direction that works better for patients. To be clear, with MACRA, we answered one question and opened up a set of others that is now ours to begin to address. To start with, Congress had designed the SGR to control costs in Medicare so that every American who pays into the system will have the care they need when they need it. Before Medicare, one in three seniors lived in poverty. Today, that number is less than one in 10. And without a focused effort at delivering care while controlling costs, Medicare, upon which so many of us depend, risks becoming unaffordable. And as the Medicare program moves into its golden years, so does the reality of the job it must do in caring for the nation's elderly and disabled. There are 10,000 new Medicare beneficiaries every day. A boom generation is turning 70, and the 85 and up generation is set to double over the next 10 years. With the growth of Medicare beneficiaries outpacing the growth of working Americans, we need to find ways, as we do across other sectors, to deliver better care at lower costs. So ensuring a stable and reliable Medicare program is a tough task. Through the ACA, we've extended the life of the Medicare Trust Fund from 2018 to 2030, which just happens to be the year I turned 64. So together, Congress and stakeholders designed a law that promotes ever-improving care at a reasonable cost. It replaces the blunt instrument of SGR with a system that preserves the core structure of Medicare this new program wraps around changes intended to promote coordinated care at reasonable costs through the merit-based system, a new uniform merit-based system. The system is defined in the statute to focus on quality, cost, technology, and practice improvement. The system also allows physicians and other clinicians to define and advance new approaches to care for patients like medical homes, specialty models, and team-based models that improve quality, manage costs, and reward physicians in those models with additional bonuses. But the first question, of course, for many physicians, is what you need to really know about the program. What new sets of requirements are there to participate? So let me be clear in our objective. While it is an understandable distraction, the goal of the program is to return the focus to patient care, not spend time learning a new program. Medicare will still pay for services as it always has, and every physician and other participating clinician will have the opportunity to be paid more for better care and for making investments that support patients, like having a staff member follow up with patients at home. And we will, of course, provide information in as much or as little detail as is helpful. For those who like to read computer manuals end to end, there is of course the 900 page proposed rule, complete with every detail about how the regulation and the law is supposed to work. But for most people who do not need to see every scenario and how each element of the formula works, webinars, in-person meetings, fact sheets, and web portals will bring all the information to suit various needs there are several immediate features of the program that I want to start out with that are designed as improvements over today's system. 
First, MACRA sunsets three disjointed programs. If you participate in the physician quality reporting system, the value modifier, and the meaningful use program, your life just got simpler as they replaced them with a single aligned quality payment program, which will reduce reporting requirements, eliminate duplication, and reduce the number of measures. For those who participate in alternative payment models, those requirements are reduced further or eliminated. Second, it also reduces the combined possible downward adjustment of 9% that is occurring today from the three programs to a maximum of 4% the first year. Now the program is designed to build up over the course of several years with more modest financial impacts in the first year when the vast majority of physicians are expected to be in the MIPS part of the program. So while the merit-based incentive program of the law is designed to be budget neutral in general, there are new opportunities for additional bonuses. In MIPS, the, in addition to the 4% bonus and a positive payment adjustment, there's the potential for much higher payments through $500 million set aside for funding over the first six years. And physicians, of course, can earn a 5% lump sum bonus for participating in an advanced alternative payment model. Under the current proposed timing, the first reporting isn't due until early 2018. And off-the-shelf tools like certified EHRs and clinical data registries can provide the complete capabilities to report, but other options will exist as well, including most reporting that a physician is doing today. And if CMS can get data automatically or through another source, we will do so. With this legislation, we now have the responsibility and the opportunity to work together to fill in the important details. So my first commitment is that we do this as open and transparent and iterative as way as possible. Now, I want to start off talking a little bit about our process for a simple reason. I'm convinced that adding new regulations to an already busy health system without improving how the pieces fit together just will not work. I've always been a believer that good policy, like any plans, only gets you 10% of the way there. So it's how we implement MACRA over the next period that counts. So we've adapted an outside-in approach that we label user-driven policy design. This approach calls on us to conduct an unprecedented effort at listening and learning. And I will confess that this is a new way of working for CMS. I know from my time outside that CMS can appear to be a black box with opaque regulations and limited back and forth about our policy reasoning or our implementation constraints. <coughs> People won't always agree with us, and that's okay. But we also need to be open to being convinced when we have something wrong or need to re-steer in a different direction as we recently did with meaningful use. And this world is not filled with perfect answers. All of this means that policy cannot be written from behind our desk and our career staff and our regions have been tasked with connecting us closer and closer to where care actually happens. We began this by reaching out and meeting with over 6,300 stakeholders all across the country before we published the proposed rule in April. One particular foc our particular focus was on meeting with practicing physicians in their offices in workshops, in focus groups, and in weekly sessions on, to discuss policy options and to dig into details on how the concepts of MACRA translate into the realities of a busy practice. <coughs> and since proposing the rule at the end of April, we've held over 135 events centered on physicians and clinicians affected by the quality payment program. These conversations are grounding our priorities, and we are hearing some hard but important truths. 
physicians are frustrated. We hear about the overwhelming sense that measures have become an exercise in compliance instead of quality improvement, about how technology is often distracted instead of supported patient care, and how an accumulation of many small things imposed from afar add up to a feeling that we just don't get it. Now this gives us all a place to start thinking about this new quality payment program framework and developing a roadmap that not only improves patient care, but does it by beginning to address some of the underlying and very real issues of physician burnout. Let me give you a few examples of what we've heard. One comment summed up the feelings of many. Let us practice medicine and not practice documentation and bureaucracy. We don't have it in us. We are caregivers. Let us do our job. A rheumatologist located in the Mid-Atlantic said that we needed to figure out how to get doctors' noses out of computers and back to patient care. A primary care doctor from Arkansas who was looking forward to joining a medical home commented, there's so much money in healthcare, but we need to direct it the right way. So through our listening sessions, a number of specific areas have been identified for us to work on that people believe can really improve the system. Providing reports and using quality measures that are more timely and helpful to practice improvement. Providing support specifically for smaller practices which feel the burden of increased paperwork without the staff to handle it. Allowing physicians You can clap any time you want. <laughs> and I'll pause. <laughs> Thank you. You can tell I'm not used to it. Not in this job. Allowing physicians more participation in selecting measures and in allowing physicians to focus only on what's relevant to their specialty or practice and ignoring the rest. Putting more pressure on technology vendors and less burden on physicians so physicians can do simple things like track referrals when a patient sees another specialist or visits a hospital. Making sure there are sufficient paths to participate in alternative payment models. And working to reduce the cost of reporting so the juice is worth the squeeze. So, so openly and honestly addressing these challenges and others we hear gives us the path to improving how the Medicare program works for you and will lead to getting better results for our beneficiaries. After listening to many sessions, personally visiting practices, and hearing the concerns expressed by many, I have no illusions that frustrations and challenges that have built up over many years will be resolved overnight. While I know many of you support the MACRA legislation and the quality payment program it introduces, I also know that no one likes all the details and new details create uncertainty. The unintended consequences of new laws and regulations, particularly on top of an already overburdened physician practice, can make as many things worse as they do better. Complexity is not our friend. We'll be smart if we look at the quality payment program as a framework that we can work with that if implemented with care can begin the process of turning things around to a more sensible, simpler approach where physicians and other clinicians will feel supported by laws and regulations, the technology vendors and the infrastructure that surrounds them. And this is why we need to be so committed to a collaborative implementation, increased transparency and continual improvement processes so that over the next several years, we allow feedback on the ground to inform the policies we implement. So let me get a little bit into the policy red meat. And rather than go through each element of the program, I want to cover four of the cross-cutting themes that have emerged to us through our listening sessions with many of you. First, 
is to be patient-centered, not only in the focus of the program, but in our approach to everything, so that we can promote the highest quality and most coordinated care for beneficiaries with the least disruption to the physicians and other clinicians who are treating them. Second, allowing practices the flexibility to drive how they use the program as much as possible so that it supports the unique needs of their patients and allows adjustments as time goes on. Third, focus on the unique concerns of small practices as well as rural practices and practices in underserved areas. Fourth, simplify wherever and whenever possible so that we can reduce the noise from the signal and give physicians back time to spend with patients. I'll spend just a minute discussing each of these four areas. Then I'm going to uh, call out some specific areas of feedback and then have time to take a few questions. First, keeping patients at the center. The law builds on the evidence that's emerging that the care coordination and focus on quality is improving patient outcomes. Last January, Secretary Burwell committed to moving the majority of Medicare payments to approaches that are linked to quality of care and smarter spending by 2018. Now, payment systems are not intended, in my view, to be finely calibrated models that we should expect to be performed to the test. In all my years, I have never met, nor do I hope to meet, a physician who makes her decision on how to treat a patient based upon how she gets paid. She does what she thinks is right for the patient and hopes that the system will support her in that. Physicians and the patients they treat deserve approaches that support them for doing the right thing, that encourage physicians to collaborate and reduce waste, and keep people at home and in comfortable settings so their lives can continue as normally as possible. So over the last couple of years, we've been rapidly advancing models that put patients back in the center with over 9 million Medicare beneficiaries today in accountable care organizations, the recent introduction of the largest primary care medical home model ever launched called CPC Plus, a series of bundled payment initiatives, and newer specialty models like in oncology and end-stage adrenal disease. The work in front of us is over time to develop a pipeline of advanced alternative payment models, and work with physicians to generate more. Now, MIPS is intended to move the focus to patients as well. There are a menu of more than 90 clinical practice improvement activities for physicians to choose from, which support patient-friendly steps, such as expanding office hours, or developing specific care plans, or using evidence-based aids that help support shared decision-making. And if not, part of an advanced payment model. The program encourages participation in the clinical registry, which provides timely quality improvement feedback, far timelier than Medicare provides, as you know. If participating in an APM or a clinical registry, no other quality reporting is required. Either way, we need these first steps to help us move away from a compliance program towards something that is patient-centered. And as I said, it's also time for us to ask more of the technology and technology vendors. This is particularly true. It's particularly true in the area of what many people call interoperability, but which actually most physicians simply describe as allowing the data to move back and forth between the systems so that they can follow the movement of their patient after they make a referral or before they get a referral. Along with relief for meaningful use, this is the number one ask of many physicians. As in the rest of our lives, the burden needs to be on the technology, not the user. <laughs> EHR vendors and hospitals that use them 
will now be required to open up their APIs so data can move in and out of an application safely and securely. And this will also help eliminate one of my pet peeves, which I call desktop lock, that occurred based on early EHR decisions by allowing technology to more easily plug and play. Today's data silos are more a function of business practices than technology limitations, and we cannot tolerate it any longer. <laughs> second, priority, second priority is to allow practices to drive how they participate in the program. We heard directly from many physicians, and specialists in particular, that a one-size-fits-all program won't work. In fact, it may not surprise you that with a lot of the physicians who have given us direct input, there's even diverse opinion. <laughs> We've heard from some that we should reduce measures and from others that we should add measures, that there's too much complexity and not enough good options. So that's why we have to aim for the sweet spot of building a program that will be as flexible as possible so physicians can focus on what's right for their patients and make sense in their local communities and choose from a number of ways to participate in the quality payment program. That means more options on choosing appropriate measures, options on whether to participate in models like accountable care organizations, medical homes, and the flexibility to move between them without having to report multiple times. It also means using quality measures selected directly from work from the specialty societies. For specialists, there are many different avenues to success within the quality payment program. Already nationally, 70% of practices that participate in accountable care organizations represent specialists. And we are working on the development of more specialty-focused models to go along with the oncology care model launching this year. Third priority area is a focus on policies that are based on the needs of small practices or practices in rural or underserved areas. So we have to make sure that our policies fit with the realities of the local markets where you operate. To be blunt, we all need to acknowledge and then to work against the reality that many changes in healthcare today just make it more difficult for solo and small practices to stay independent. So to level the playing field against these changes, more complexity, the fast pace of change, the call for more uh, collaboration around the patient, we need to focus hard on the areas which increase the costs of operating a practice and look for other things we can do to offset these challenges. We call direct attention to this by publishing a schedule that determines, that demonstrates the negative impact on solo and small practices when they don't report. Under the quality payment program, we know that physicians and small practices who do report their performance can do equivalently well to mid-sized practices. While the results in the schedule we showed pertain to 2014, we do expect reporting from small practices to be well above those levels. However, to be clear, solo and small group practices that don't report will be negatively impacted. So in our implementation, we're committed to significantly reducing the financial cost and the burden of reporting so that it can be easy for small physicians to report as for large physicians. We're seeking input how best to do this, but have already taken steps such as allowing reporting from multiple sources a physician may already use, increasing the number of items that can be reported through just simple attestations, eliminating duplicate reporting, and using data feeds such as claims whenever possible so the physicians don't have to do a thing. We're also working with physician user groups to design a simpler portal that is intuitive and easy to use, which I will discuss further in a moment. There are other areas that are of importance to small practices that we are focused on as well, including increased technical assistance, exemptions for small volume practices, 
and extra credit for participating in medical home models like CPC Plus, our largest medical home model, which was designed based on the input from physicians and offers supplemental payments for investments in care coordination. This summer, physicians can apply for CPC Plus in regions across the country, and we're mapping out other future opportunities to increase small practice participation in APMs. And small practice burden is a core area we're soliciting direct feedback on specifically. And finally, and perhaps more far-reaching, through a network of learning collaboratives that are already on the ground educating physicians, including the associations in the room today, so that we can move the quality payment program from policy made in Washington, D.C. as quickly as possible to the medicine practiced around the country. We look forward to further targeting support to small, rural, and underserved providers through $20 million in annual funding over the next five years. Fourth, simplifying wherever and whenever possible. The law actually gives us a unique opportunity. Over the years, because physician performance programs proliferated as one-off programs from Congress, over time, regulations multiplied and documentation burden increased. Even when CMS made improvements, they were piecemeal and the impacts modest, as these programs by their nature couldn't be coordinated or rationalized. Without a legislative change like the one we have, we couldn't address the larger problems. One of the major opportunities is to use our rulemaking process now and going forward to connect these programs together. The good news is that the combined magnitude and reporting effort are far less than are currently in a set, of, in, in a set framework for even further simplification over time. However, one reason we think we're hearing con concern from physicians is that this is the first time that the entirety of these programs can be seen end-to-end -end in one place. So I'll call attention to three simplifications in the proposed rule and strongly encourage you to find us more. Reduced burden. We've reduced by one-third the number of quality metrics that need to be reported. And we align these measures across the reporting categories to end repetitive reporting. We got rid of measures in the advancing care information category that hindered usability. And in that category, we moved the focus from clicking to care provision and collaboration. Much of advancing care information can be done through attestation. And it's no longer all or nothing. And there are a variety of paths that can be selected by a physician practice. We're simplifying the process. Physicians may report as a group and be assessed as a group across each of these performance categories. You can pick how you want to report, and you can use it throughout the program. You don't have to stop and switch because of differing requirements. And we use the core quality measures so that you can use the same measures across different payers. And third, we're making the programs talk to each other. So if you're in an alternative payment model, for example, like an accountable care organization, or through CPC Plus, then your job will be half done from day one. You report your quality measures using the same process you've always used for your model, plus you automatically earn credit in the clinical practice improvement activities for being in that APM. And if you see a substantial number of patients through an advanced APM, you qualify for a 5% bonus. Even as we look to the development of the program over the first few years, we're committed to make the start as smooth as possible. I know that there are specific concerns about whether there's sufficient time for physicians to be ready for the new system to start when the first reporting period is scheduled to begin in January. So we're in active dialogue on this topic and seeking active input on options. There are, of course, constraints and trade-offs. Reporting is actually due to be reduced when the program starts, for example. But we're working together and are communicating openly about these trade-offs as we solicit comments on the right approach. We don't profess to have all the answers. In fact, right now, as we're talking through the details with physicians, 
patient groups and other clinicians and stakeholders. We're also in the process of collecting comments. Over the past month, I've probably asked people to submit their comments on the proposed rule over 100 times. We're making this push because there's no monopoly on some of these approaches. Some of these questions are difficult, and the more input, the better. Final comments are due June 27th. All feedback is helpful, although I like to say suggestions for solutions are even more helpful. And we continue to look for comments both on individual policy areas and on cross-cutting topics, such as how to simplify further, how to align the performance categories, how to make sure we're not encouraging compliance, but rather rewarding for good care, how to simplify and provide transparency to calculations, and how to encourage and promote participation of APMs and advanced APMs. Once the quality payment program is rolled out, I want to make it clear that this constant request for feedback and the need to improve will continue. Things won't change overnight. The first year of this new program will hit bumps as new policies run into the realities of everyday medicine. Systems will need to adapt to your needs. Long-time frustrations won't appear right away. I'm asking for your ongoing collaboration over the next several years so that we can implement, receive feedback, iterate, and progress. You may need to think about designing your own feedback report for CMS. And judging from my inbox some days, I think that's already started. We won't win back the hearts and minds with empty promises of quick fixes. We win them back by listening, by making progress, even in small steps, and by calling attention to where the system remains dysfunctional. We don't have the option of running from these challenges because it's at the very heart of the care we get, that our family gets, and that our country gets. I understand the temptation for this program to become a lightning rod for all that's wrong with the practice of medicine today. I understand it. But I ask that you not make it the case that until every element is perfect, physicians remain cynical and on the sidelines. I promise you that this process and this program will be better with your input and participation as you help make sure it connects as closely as possible to supporting the realities of patient care. It is essential that physicians not only participate in, but have a leading voice in the change that is ahead. Seven years ago, President Obama came here to the AMA at the onset of his presidency and challenged us to participate in another change, not to accept the status quo and to move the country forward to an unknown path of health reform. It's thanks to your, your courage and the hard work and passion of many of the people in this room, pre-existing conditions are now a thing of the past. that preventive and comprehensive benefits are a minimum standard, that science, not insurance company policy, determines coverage guidelines, <laughs> and that 20 million Americans now have access to coverage and care for their families. I urge you, we must do the same thing now use every opportunity to commit to the quadruple aim as the key to defining a new future in the healthcare system. Now, I've given you several examples of visits I've had with physicians from across the country and have been sure to share the most critical. But I also have seen what happens when the tide turns, and so have many of you. A physician in New Jersey told me that as part of a medical home, he's now setting up Skype, uh, Skype villages to connect his elderly patients to each other. Another in Oregon fulfilled her vision of being able to coordinate real-time mental health handoffs as a game changer for her community. A physician in Arkansas told me that once ready to retire early, they were now extending their retirement to 70 because, he, because of how he was getting paid was catching up to how he wanted to practice. 
when we all, policymakers, physicians, patients, hospitals, innovators, focus with a single purpose, we can make this admittedly infrequent but significant progress that I believe is ahead of us. We can do it. It's our responsibility to do it. And I look forward to taking on these challenges together. So thank you for having me today. Thank you for bringing your gifts to heal our country when we need it the most. And I look forward to our continued work together.